This is muscle video number nine, and in this one, we're gonna continue on with the learning objectives from the last video. So in the last video, we really just covered this, the overview of excitation contraction coupling, where we looked at this slide and had a broad picture perspective of looking at the nerve and how it um, uh, excites the muscle and how that excitation of the muscle then ultimately leads to its contraction. And how did that happen? It happened because while well, I generated an electrical signal, it traveled down like the wave throughout the length of the muscle fiber Fiber, then in deep into the fiber itself, it slapped this yellow bag or this purple bag called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum then is a bag full of calcium and it spills out those calciums. And those calcium ions then will diffuse over, bind to some proteins over here. And then that is the trigger to make those proteins do what they do. And when those proteins do what they do, um, which we have to define, um, then that's when we see point A, point B, point B then goes to point A or vice versa. That's when we see actual muscle contraction. So that was the overview. So in this one, we're going to stick with the electrical part here. And we're just going to actually look at um, what does, uh, let, let's ignore part A, and we're just going to really look at what are the properties along the cell membrane? What is the electrical property along the cell membrane? And that is what's going to give us this thing of called resting memory potential. So let's just get this out of the way. That word potential can be a kind of weird word for a lot of folks. In this case, all it is, it's a description of the electrical properties of something. Um, if you say the weight of something, the, if you say something's weight, it's really an indicator of how much stuff there is, uh, the, the gravitational force upon that mass, so to speak. And so um, potential is just a descriptor of the electrical properties. How, how, what is the electricalness here? Is the electricalness negative 10? Is electricalness negative 70? Um, what is the, the electrical properties across that cell membrane? So that's really what we want to look at. So let's start off with our cell. What I've indicated here in yellow is the cell. And remember that the two players that we really care about are sodium and potassium. But sodium and potassium, although the, the, those are the two main players, um, there's another player set up in the background. And that background, there's not a lot of dynamic activity, but he's there. And that background are these little hash marks, and that is protein. So you've got tons of protein, and that's these hash marks are supposed to be negative symbols. Negative, 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 negative. You've got these negatively charged proteins proteins on the inside of my cell. And so they just are. How negative are they? Well, it doesn't really matter. We don't have a number to them, uh, but we're going to say they're really, really negative. There's tons of negatively charged proteins on the inside of the cell. So if we stop right there for a second, before we continue, if we were to say, okay, look, if all I've got is protein on the inside of my cell, and what I do is I take like a little electricalness measuring stick, and I stick that electricalness measuring stick right here on the inside of the cell, what do I measure? Is the inside of the cell very negative or is it very positive? And your answer at this point should be, the inside of the cell is very negative. How negative? Who cares? It just is very negative on account of these proteins that we have present there, okay? So that is, it's got a negative membrane potential. That's the terminology we'll use here. It's got a negative membrane potential. Now let's set up our ions. And again, what are the two ions that we care about? We care about sodium and potassium. So what we have here is sodium. I put sodium here in, in green with a plus sign because if you remember back to our chemistry unit, sodium itself um, tends to exist as a positively charged cation. Remember, it's got that extra electron. It gives that up to satisfy the octet rule to have a satisfied valence shell. So therefore, we've got these positively charged sodium ions. Now, if you just look at it here, where do I have a higher concentration of sodium ion? On the inside or the outside of the cell? And though I think it's pretty intuitive, I've labeled here the inside of the cell, because th this these are the boundaries of the cell, and this is the outside of the cell. So again, the question is, where do I have a higher concentration of sodium on the inside or the outside? Well, clearly, based on this illustration, I have a higher concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell. Now, that is a fact. It's just a fact that you're going to have to remember forever. You're going to have to remember for the rest of this course, as well as all of Bio 142. You're going to have to remember when you study the heart, when you study the kidneys, when you study the GI system, when you study the... Uh, the nervous system, um, you're going to see this principle all over the place that sodium is primarily located in your body in extracellular environments. Extracellular means outside the cell. Intracellular would mean inside the cell and extracellular then is outside. So again, where is sodium primarily concentrated? It is extracellular. 
Now, if we take that, then we think about the stuff that we've... Actually, before we move on, let's look at the setup for potassium. So this is the setup for sodium. Let's now look at the setup for potassium. For potassium, same question. Where do we see potassium uh, primarily concentrated? Is he located primarily inside or outside the cell? And when you look at the picture, we have it on the inside. So lots of potassium on the inside, very little on the outside of cell. Again, protein, there's still tons on the inside. That doesn't change. Okay, so this is our setup. If we put the two pictures together, then this is what we see. A lot of sodium on the outside and a lot of potassium on the inside. Now, these two cells really should overlap. I'm not quite ready to draw that out for you yet, but, but really that's the big picture. In fact, you know, now that you get that, let's go ahead and draw that out. Okay, so if we overlap these two pictures here, these two pictures, if we overlap them, then this is actually what the cell looks like. And so where, oops, I, I need to take one of these out. I need to bring this into the extracellular environment. So again, now the question then is, where do I see a high, higher concentration of sodium, inside or outside? And the answer, of course, is outside. Where do I see a higher concentration of potassium, inside or outside? And the answer, of course, then is on the inside. So here's the next question then. The question then becomes, so here's the next question. The question then becomes, let's actually go to question number two. Which way does sodium want to move and why? And then so question three is, which way does potassium want to move and why? So again, these guys want to move. And what I want you to think about right now is the term diffusion. So pause the video and define diffusion. Hopefully you did. What diffusion is? Diffusion is the movement of stuff from high concentration and low concentration. So say that differently then. Which way does sodium want to move from out to in? Or does he want to move from in to out? Which way does sodium itself want to move? Well, what you should be saying is that, well, I've got a high concentration of sodium on the outside. And since I've got a high concentration of sodium, sodium wants to move from out to in, as I've indicated with that arrow right over here. This is how sodium wants him to move. Now, why does he want to move that way? Because he wants to go down his concentration gradient. On the other hand, which way does potassium want to move? Potassium wants to move then, well, from in to out because he wants to move down his concentration created. So that should be pretty intuitive to you folks. So the other thing that I'd wanna say is that if you look at sodium, let, let's just look at sodium first. Let me, let me backtrack and let's look here. If we go back to this picture, which way does sodium wanna move? Well, from out to in. Now, why does he wanna move from out to in? The reason he wants to move from out to in is twofold. Number one, because his concentration gradient, gradient, oh boy, gradient is set up it's set up that way, okay? Number two, I'm gonna introduce a new concept to you and that is the electrical gradient. Electrical gradient is also set up that way. And what I mean by that is this, what kind of charge does sodium have? It's got a positive charge. What kind of charge is on the inside of the cell? Because of these proteins, it's massively negative. So what that means is sodium has two motivations to go from out to in. First is the concentration gradient. There's just way more of them on the outside. Number two is the electrical gradient. If that sounds funny to you, it, it really shouldn't. You guys have all experienced this before. Let's say you have your, your friend call you up and say, hey, let, let's go watch a movie this weekend. I wanna go see whatever movies out there. And so you may have a couple motivations. Number one, your motivation is that I wanna hang out with my friend. Number two, the motivation is, oh, you know what? That's a really cool movie. I've been wanting to see that anyway. So there's two motivations for you to actually accept that invitation. Now, if we go then look at the potassium then, if we go and look at potassium, then we'll see something with potassium. Now, if you look at potassium, which way does the concentration gradient want me to move? Uh, concentration is set up so that potassium wants to move from the inside to the outside. But then what about the electrical gradient? Potassium's got a positive charge and I've got a negatively charged environment on the inside. So electrically, I actually wanna come from out to in, right? Actually, I wanna move this way from out to in. And so you'll see that I've got opposing forces here. And that might be something like this. Look, I, I mean, your friend invites you to the movies and motivation number one says, yeah, man, I wanna go because I wanna go see my friend. But motivation number two might say, that sounds like a really, really stupid movie, or I've already seen that movie before. So what do you do? On the one hand, you wanna see your friend. On the other hand, you don't wanna go watch a stupid movie. So what do you do? Well, we don't really know, right? The only way for us to make a prediction here is to actually have scientists measure and observe what's happening. So we can make a prediction that it would go this way based on the concentration gradient, 
gradient, but we can make a prediction that it would want to stay in based on the electrical gradient. So which way does it move? And the reality is it'll move from in to out. At the end of the day, you decide to go hang out with your friend despite the dumb movie you guys are about to see. So that all together is termed the electrochemical gradient. So if I were to ask you, the chemical gradient, if, I, if my question were, the chemical gradient for sodium makes it want to go from where to where, you'd say out to in. If I say the electrical gradient for sodium makes it want to move which way, you would say, well, actually conveniently out to in. And so I've got two motivations driving me from out to in, yay. But on the other hand, for potassium, the chemical gradient for potassium drives him from in to out. The electrical gradient drives him from out to in. Of course, we can't separate out the chemicalness from the electricalness because the chemicals themselves are charged. So overall, we term this the electrochemical gradient. So the electrochemical gradient for potassium drives him from inside to out. So what wins? Friendship wins. Friendship overcomes the desire to see a bad movie. And so these two sentences you have to know again for the rest of your life. Realistically, you just got to know this because it's going to pop up in so many different areas. Um, these properties that I'm describing here for the muscle is also true for cardiac muscle. It's also true for neurons. It's also true for kidney cells, so on and so forth. You're going to see it all over the place so that if anybody ever asks you where is sodium located, intracellular, extracellular, you should say extracellular. And if they ask you which way does sodium want to move, you would say he wants to move from out to in. And same thing with potassium, which, uh, where is he located? He's located intracellularly. Which way does he want to move? He wants to move from inside to out. So that's what happens. So now let's look at, so let me pause there for a second. What you should all do right now is that you should pause the video and make sure all of this stuff makes sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, there's no need to move forward. If this doesn't make sense, if the setup, if the intrinsic motivation, the, 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 the desire for sodium to move from out to in, as well as for potassium to move from in to out, if that doesn't make sense, then there's no way in the world that anything else will make sense. This is one of those things. Look, if you did never learned what the deltoid does, and then you know you were going on to a lower extremity quiz, there's no point in going back to the deltoid. Just focus in on rectus femoris, you know, and all those other lower extremity muscles. But in this case, you you can't ignore this. You can't build. Um, uh, we can't build concepts on top of this unless you know this. This really is a foundational um, thing for all of physiology, not just muscle function. So I really strongly want to encourage you. Um, I, I've often said to people on campus that this really is the most important lecture all semester long. Uh, so please make sure you understand everything that I've just gone through. If you don't, go rewind and listen to it all over again um, and, and, and teach it to your neighbor. Be able to answer these questions effectively. So now assuming you've done that, um, let's move on to this question. Can sodium or potassium move across? And, and really what I say here is without a door or channel, why? And this hinges on your understanding of uh, the cell membrane. So remember that this is your cell membrane. We've got a phospholipid bilayer. We've got polar heads and nonpolar tails, polar heads, nonpolar tails. So this big thickness here is hydrophobic. On the outside, this is hydrophilic. So the hydrophilic portions of the phospholipid bilayer face the external as well as the internal watery or aqueous environments. And so this is the cell membrane. So what you can imagine, you can imagine then all these sodium Sodium ions. These sodium ions are located on the outside of the cell, and again, they want to move to the inside of the cell. So all I've done here is I've taken this image, which by now, this image right over here, which you should be comfortable with, sodium on the outside, a little bit of sodium on the inside, and sodium wants to go from outside the cell to inside the cell. We're just looking at it from a different perspective here, that these sodiums want to go from outside the cell to inside the cell. The question then becomes, can they do it? Can they actually do it? And your answer actually should be, Ugh, they're going to need a little bit of help. Why do they need some help? Because look at sodium. Sodium has a charge to it. And this is saying this is a big hydrophobic area. So the moment sodium tries to enter in, if you can visualize this, here comes sodium going down as such a chemical gradient. Once he gets into this hydrophobic area, it's just going to push him out. Remember that um, hydrophobic and hydrophilic stuff don't really mix well together. So sodium cannot actually permeate through this cell membrane because of that hydrophobic nature. So the reality is, which way does sodium want to go? Sodium wants to go from out to in. But then the question is, can he go? And the answer is no, not unless you have a door. So 
Why can sodium potassium move without a door or channel? Why or why not? Well, it can't because it's hydrophobic on the inside and both sodium and potassium are charged. Um, we can picture the same thing if all these NAs were potassium and they would be located on the inside of the cell. And so then these would wanna go from in to out. But the problem stays the same. The problem is that you've got these positively charged cations trying to penetrate through a hydrophobic region of the cell membrane. So you need sodium channels. Uh, we will end up talking about those channels at another point. So you will need sodium channels as well as potassium channels. Um, and those are, those are gonna be made up of different proteins. Now, here's the, the, the last question here. Um, net movement, um, hang on, let me, let me try to set this up. When sodium comes in, let, let's assume there's a channel in here now, right? Let, let's just assume there's some magic protein channel in here and that protects you from the hydrophobicness. And now sodiums can now work its way through. Oops, sodiums now can work their way through and one by one, oh, you didn't quite see that. So here again is your protein channel. I just kind of made it a little bit more see-through. And then which way does sodium want to go? It's going to go through these channels and it's going to make its way in. So another sodium is going to travel through this channel and it's going to make its way in. So the question then becomes, how much sodium moves from the outside to the inside? Is it going to be to this point where we basically just have um, equal amounts on both sides? Let me just delete this one. So now we have four. Oh, I shouldn't have deleted that. So now we have um, five on the outside and we have five on the inside. So is that what's gonna happen? Now we have equal amounts. So ready, true or false, there's still a gradient set up. And the answer is no, there's no more uh, concentration gradient set up. So at this point, sodium no longer has any motiv motivation to go from outside to in because there's equal concentrations on the inside and outside. And so that's what I've tried to indicate over here, right over here and over here. The reality is this just will not happen. Um, this will not occur. So. Um, let me backtrack again. If I ask you the question, how much sodium is gonna go from outside to the inside? Your answer is as much sodium as it takes until you reach equilibrium. Now, if you're hearing what I just said, and you're contrasting it with this picture here, I just told you this will never happen. Well, the reason this will never happen is that this is actually not equilibrium. I know the title of the slide here is equilibrium, but equilibrium by definition is this, and this is really important that you remember this. Equilibrium is where the net movement into the cell is the same as the net movement out of the cell. It does not mean, here in red, it does not mean the concentrations are equal on both sides. This right here is not equilibrium. Equilibrium is when the relative number of sodium coming in is same as the uh, sodium coming out. In other words, if I have an arrow where sodium are now coming in here at, I don't know, one sodium per hour, then if I also have a rate where sodium is exiting at about one sodium per hour, now I'm at equilibrium. However, what I'm gonna tell you, and you gotta trust me on this, is that when sodium reaches equilibrium, you actually still have a ton of sodium on the outside. So this is the, con you still have a high concentration of sodium on the outside, low concentration of sodium on the inside, when the rate of movement is gonna be the same. Let me give you this example. Look, I want you to picture a, a game. So we've got a stadium, just for argument's sake, let's say that this stadium seats 100,000 people. So at the be very, very beginning, uh, before the game starts, let's say two hours before, um, let's imagine this. Okay, so let's imagine this. Um, I, just, I just wrote this in, hopefully this will help you guys out. And so I want you to imagine this stadium that seats 100,000 people. And so four hours before game, before the game, uh, there's zero people inside the stadium and 100,000 people outside. Are we at equilibrium? The answer is no. Two hours before the game, 100 people are inside, 99,900 people are outside, You know, somewhere tailgating in the parking lot or whatever. Are we at equilibrium? And the answer is no. So again, keep in mind, what are we talking about here? The definition of equilibrium is where movement in is the same as movement out. To say it differently, the rate of movement in is the same as the rate of movement out. It is not having to do with the concentrations on either side. So let's go about one hour before game time. What we see is there's 50,000 people inside, 50,000 people outside. Now, 
If you don't understand equilibrium, at this point, you might be tempted to say, aha, we are at equilibrium one hour before game time because there's 50,000 people on the inside and 50,000 people lined up waiting to get in at the gates, kind of slowly trickling in. But the reason that is not equilibrium is because what is the direction of movement? It's basically one way. All 50,000 people are trying to go inside the stadium at this point and nobody is trying to get out. So the rate is not the same going in and out. At game time, 99,000 people inside, 1,000 people outside, and these 1,000 people are still trying to get inside the stadium. Are we at equilibrium? The answer is no. And in the first quarter, 99,900 people inside, zero people outside. Are we at equilibrium? Definitely not. But now, let's say you're halfway through the second quarter. At that point, what ends up happening is that there are some stragglers coming in. So if you were to sit at the gates... If you were to watch, just for argument's sake, let's just say there's one gate and you prop yourself there just to watch. At any given point, even in the second quarter, you're going to see the latecomers coming in. They were stuck in traffic, lunch went late, the babysitter didn't make it to the house on time. So let's say in the next minute you count about 100 people moving into the stadium. If you were to watch, and that same minute, you're probably going to count about 100 people walking out of the stadium because the babysitter called and their, their kid got sick or a mom is in the hospital or whatever it might be. So at this point, you've got most of the people on the inside of the stadium. But if you were to stand at the gates, about 100 per minute are coming in and 100 per minute are also going out. That right there is equilibrium. So equilibrium, again, is not equal concentrations on both sides of the cell. What equilibrium is, is when the rate of exit and the rate of entry is the same. So when I ask you the question, how much sodium comes in, as much sodium as it takes until you reach an equilibrium? How much potassium does it take? As much potassium as it takes until you reach an equilibrium. So if you're thinking this through, you might be saying to yourself, hang on, dude, you're, you're saying then that sodium comes out to in. Are you telling me that in some conditions sodium also goes in and out? I am saying yes. That actually does occur. We don't need to talk about exactly why right now, but you need to trust me that, yeah, there is some sodium that's going to be leaking out at all times. And so uh, same, through, same, same thing here with potassium. So here's the reality. When you do reach equilibrium, when you reach equilibrium, you actually still have a higher concentration of sodium on the outside and a higher concentration of potassium on the inside. That is still the case when you reach equilibrium. However, the electrical measurements, remember my electrical measuring stick that I had before? My electrical measuring stick, the, the, the electrical property on the inside will be different when sodium is at equilibrium. The electrical properties on the inside will be different when potassium is, equi is at equilibrium. Okay, so that kind of wraps up um, the, the direction of movement of sodium potassium, this very important concept of equilibrium. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up from there and talk about these electrical properties. When sodium reaches equilibrium, the electrical property is actually plus 35 millivolts. When potassium reaches equilibrium, the electrical property there is negative 90 millivolts. So we're going to talk about that as well as give a, a hard number to resting memory potential in, in a follow-up video. So to recap, uh, we gave an overview of excitation contraction coupling. What is resting memory potential? We defined that. And oh, we didn't give it a number. So here's the number. The number is negative 70 millivolts. And that's a number you have to remember. What makes it so negative on the inside? It's protein. Now, you know these ions, where they are. You know the way the chemical gradient is set up. You know the way the electrical gradient is set up. You know the way the electrochemical gradient is set up. When sodium reaches equilibrium, for now, let's just memorize the number positive 35 millivolts and let's memorize the number negative 70 millivolts for potassium when he reaches equilibrium and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the action potential and follow-up videos